On a lonely planet, slowly spinning its way to damnation, amid the incompetence and unpreparedness of lesser space programs, one team stands resilient against the herds, putting their lives on the line to aid those who were previously unaware of the quick save option. Yes, it's the incredible adventures of Jebediah and his crack team of Kerbinoids. They are the Blunderbirds. Saving the Kerbin race, one stranded explorer at a time. Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of The Blunderbirds, the show where I traditionally rescue stranded Kerbals stuck on distant celestial objects, but this week I thought I'd deviate from formula. I saw this hilarious yet heartbreaking and oh so relatable post by Captain Kiwi, wait, Cap Tian Kiwi? <laughs> who successfully landed their Minmus lander perfectly with enough fuel remaining to make the trip home. The bad news, as I'm sure needs no explanation after the intro, is that a pesky solar panel is blocking the hatch, preventing the Kerbals from going on an EVA. This will never do. Enter this craft here. It's going to carry an engineer Kerbal to go and rendezvous with the stuck Minmus lander. We're then going to go on an EVA and by using the new some reassembly required features, we're going to get out and remove the solar panel, allowing the Kerbals inside the capsule to go on an EVA and explore the flats of Minmus. And I thought, you know, Minmus landings are not particularly challenging, so to make this interesting, I decided to come up with this little rover design. It's inspired by those, like, military style trucks. I don't know what they're called, but that kind of boxy truck that has a shape that's fairly easy to replicate by using two of the Mark II lander cans in their rover cab configurations to form the front. After that, it's just building a, a big box behind it. So fairly easy to do. It's a fairly similar chassis design, actually, to the Arctic land train that I sent to Juno last week. If you want to watch... Uh, that video, there's a card on screen. But yes, building a massive eight-wheeled rover is ludicrously overkill and unnecessary for a mission of this nature, but I thought it would make things interesting given that Minmus landings are not particularly difficult things to do. thought it would make the mission a little bit more exciting and uh, a little bit more engaging. I don't know. What do you think of this rover design? I think it came out a lot better than I thought it would, actually. I know we've still got a little bit of building left to do, but I think, as a design, I really, really liked it. And there are a few tricks up its sleeve as well inside that rear cargo bay. Yes, it's going to be functional. It's not just there to look nice. As you can see, we have some hinges in there that will open up the roof of the cargo bay, much like, I don't know, a space shuttle's cargo bay, so that we can have stuff inside, which we'll get to uh, when the time comes. First of all, I decided to just make the rear cargo bay a little bit taller because I began filling it up with stuff before realizing that it's far too flat. I guess I just sort of lost the sense of scale because I'm working with quite small pieces. So I ended up making it a bit too small for any sort of practical use. So I'm just sort of uh, retroactively making it a bit taller. I think it still looks okay in terms of aesthetic. And we've got that nice little ladder there to serve as an access point for Kerbals that use the rooftop EVA hatches on the front cab. Now, in terms of what's actually going to go inside, I'm going to skip ahead because uh, I thought it would be fun to like, oh, it's going to be a surprise what's in it and uh, keep the viewer engagement and all that. And I think it's kind of cool to like have it be revealed when the time comes. So uh, yeah, sorry about that, guys. Um, but trust me, I think it will be worth it. Now, as you can see, we're going for a similar landing platform to the one I used for my Juna land train where we have some engines that are on hinges so that they can be used for forward travel in a vacuum and then when it comes to landing we can fold those hinges so the engines are pointing down so that they can be used as retro rockets and allow the rover to land on its wheels rather than having to awkwardly land on the engines and then belly flop down potentially causing damage to the wheels which is something we really want to avoid following the some reassembly required update because wheel repair requires a finite resource anyway we're now going to skip ahead again just to uh, get the build process finished because I think the most interesting part is the construction of the rover itself and that has now concluded. So we're in the vehicle assembly building now just building a fairly bog standard rocket really. Uh, there's no real noteworthy features to it so we can just think about cross fading across to the launch. And here we go. Now uh, only a couple of things to note really. I've got four vector engines powering our first stage but I've turned the gimbal right down just because I feel like unless you're using vector engines on a space shuttle which admittedly I think is their intended purpose uh, the gimbal range is way too high and the engines just sort of wobble the whole craft around and it just becomes quite difficult to control so for rockets like this which you know 
fly fairly well. Uh, I like to just turn the gimbal down to quite low. I think they're on like 20% of their normal gimbal range. And the same thing goes for the Rhino engine above this stage. Again, the payload is not too unwieldy, so we don't really need the full gimbal range that the Rhino engine facilitates. So um, that that's just a couple of... That's just some things I did whilst building this thing that you didn't see because I skipped through the rest of the build. That's... That's all I had to say about that. And actually, we were, <laughs> that was such a long-winded explanation that it looks like we're about to uh, perform our first stage separation. There it goes. And there is the Rhino engine there. As you can see, the little exhaust plume there doesn't really deviate much when I manipulate the SAS control. Now, anyone paying attention to the staging diagram thing on the left-hand side of the screen may have noticed that this stage has a ludicrous amount of delta-v, far more than is required to circularize into low carbon in orbit. Uh, there go the fairings, by the way, as if that really needed explaining. You could, Anyway, <laughs> we've got far more delta V in this stage than we need to circularize, and that's because this stage is not only going to, you know, get us into a low Kerbin orbit, but it's also going to be the stage that gets us all the way to Minmus. The stage above it is purely going to be used to circularize at Minmus and then to land at Minmus. So we've got a lot more delta V in the upper stage than we really need because I wasn't quite sure how easy it was going to be to land uh, and I wanted to try and land quite close to the stranded vessel or at least you know, I shouldn't call it the stranded vessel should I because it's not stranded but the vessel the vessel of interest that we are going to I wanted to land quite close to that and sometimes it's nice to have a bit of excess fuel uh, the other reason why there is quite a lot of fuel in that upper stage is because the fuel tanks themselves are kind of being used as a structural reinforcement point for the rover to keep it all together and in one piece as we perform uh, things like landing burns, takeoff, that sort of thing. Uh, that's another reason why there's a bit more fuel, just because, structurally speaking, it was better to have longer fuel tanks uh, to serve as the structural anchor point. Now, as you can see, Minmus is not in the best location to get an easy encounter. Due to its inclined orbit, it's not always possible to get an encounter with its sphere of influence from a single prograde burn at low Kerbin orbit. It's possible to just wait it out until you can get an encounter with a maneuver node placed at the ascending or descending nodes, but it's not too difficult to just perform a single burn that gets those grey separation indicators as close as possible, and then performing a second separate maneuver node a little further away from Kerbin to execute the plane change required to encounter Minmus. I also didn't really want to wait until it was possible to get an easier encounter, either from low Kerbin orbit or while waiting to launch the rocket, because our Kerbals on Minmus grow warier by the second, and every moment counts when it comes to freeing them from their minty prison and letting them stretch their little legs. And there goes our transfer stage, and you may have noticed I made sure I staged it while on a Minmus collision course, so that that crashes into the surface of Minmus and does not get left stuck floating in space forever. Obviously, it's important to remember, once that's done, to perform a correction burn to ensure that the rest of the spacecraft that I prefer not to crash into the surface of Minmus doesn't meet a similar fate. Now, at the moment, our engines are aligned into their horizontal orientations, which means that the anterior engines are pointing the exact opposite way to the posterior engines. Much like two-party political systems, their opposition would result in no forward progress. Therefore, for the moment, I'm only going to use the rear terror engines to conduct our Minmus circularization and most of our Minmus landing burn and then once we get closer to the surface I'll toggle the action group that flicks the hinges into a 90 degree position and only then will I activate the front engines with both ends of the craft acting in bipartisan union. By the way while I was waffling away just then you may have noticed that I quickly deactivated and then reactivated Comnet on the difficulty settings of the game. That was purely so I could delete a maneuver node that I'd used previously and then and I just wanted to get rid of it because it looked annoying and especially because this is a video so you guys having to watch this as well I thought I know it's technically cheating to quickly change the difficulty settings midway through a mission but it was purely to just delete a maneuver node rather than create one because having an expended maneuver node UI thing next to the nav ball I think it just at least for me I, it just it's just really annoying <laughs> and I feel like you should be able to delete 
uh, maneuver nodes without having a connection to the KSC. So for the remainder of this mission, at least when we don't have a comnet connection, I'm not going to change the difficulty settings again, just for my own convenience sake. So for the purposes of maintaining integrity, I'm not going to make any more maneuver nodes for the rest of this mission to, you know, keep in the spirit of Captain Kiwi's uh, save. Luckily, we can still select vessels as a target without a comnet connection. So we can easily see where the vessel on the surface is. And I'm just sort of eyeballing it to try and uh, land somewhat close to it. As you, you may have noticed, I've flipped those hinges down into their 90 degree orientation so that our rocket engines are now pointing towards the ground and we can make use of all four Terrier engines to descend down to the surface. Now, this craft is a little bit difficult to control, but it's not too bad because the Terrier engines do have a fairly good gimbal range and SAS wheels on Minmus are pretty powerful because of Minmus's low surface gravity. So ultimately, it wasn't too difficult to perform the descent. And just before touching down, I quickly staged those side vessels so that they fly away, make sure they're definitely clear of the ship. Uh, you may be wondering, oh, aren't they just going to fly into deep space and contribute to Kessler Syndrome? Something that you always try and avoid, Matt. And don't worry, guys, they've got no SAS wheels or probe cores or anything on them. So they'll fly up at first, but then they'll start spiraling out of control and they'll crash down into the surface soon enough. And <laughs> I saw a shadow just there, actually. I was like, oh, my goodness, this is going to hit me. But luckily, uh, the shadow was just very big and it, the booster itself was uh, very far away. So it was fine. And off we go. Now, I tested this truck on Kerbin, but I, uh, perhaps I should have. I didn't, I didn't test it on the surface of Minmus, but it's much more difficult to control than on the surface of Kerbin because of Minmus's lower surface gravity. Uh, it does tend to be a little bit flip happy, I guess, because it's got quite a high center of mass and it doesn't have a very wide stance. Uh, I think a good tip for a Minmus rover would be make it nice and wide so it doesn't really flip quite so easily and try and concentrate the center of mass to be as low to the ground as possible. Possible, again to try and negate the uh, flippiness of it <laughs> that's the real that's the real uh, physics term by the way flippiness when it comes to the stability of uh, surface rovers so yeah I, I would say we're driving towards the target but at this point I'd say we're probably more akin to hop skipping and jumping towards the target Oh, little pop it pop a wheelie <laughs> as we arrived that was purely for style guys and completely intentional let me assure you uh, oh, overshot once again. Yeah, the brakes don't really work too well on the surface of Minmus either. I guess because there's less weight pressing down on the wheel, so the craft just needs more time to stop. I overshot a couple of times, actually, uh, before that point, but it's fine. We're here now, and we can get our... Uh, I don't actually know what that thing is called, the little gun thing. The uh, IVA... Sorry, EVA manipulation gun? I have no idea. The little thing that lets you build craft in space, basically. And now we can remove the offending solar panel. I thought whilst we're here, we may as well just configure the re-entry pod to be a little bit safer. All those appendages sticking out of the main pod itself, they're going to probably overheat when we do our curb and re-entry. We don't want explosions that close to the kerbals inside. So I decided to move those down to the expendable lower stage. And then once that is all done, we can just fly our way down to the surface and plant our Blunderbirds flag. Planting the flag, of course, is the most important part of any mission. I'm sure you will all agree. And then we can get Captain Kiwi's kerbals on their EVA that they were so excited to perform. They've been waiting so long as well, longer than any kerbal should when it comes to uh, exploring celestial bodies and it I, I I'm getting emotional to be honest you know it's been a, they've been waiting a long time I don't know how long they've been waiting but they've been waiting a significant amount of time and there they are on EVA uh, now some of you may be wondering how I how do I plan to get Matt Kerman back to Kerbin because, you know, the rover has no means of getting back to Kerbin and the command pod of Captain Kiwi's vessel only has space for three Kerbals, which are all already occupied. But, dear viewer, you forget one thing I didn't tell you what was in the back of this rover. I mean, I'm guessing people probably guessed, but I'm still going to act like it's a big surprise anyway. We can get back in the rover and reveal the Kerbin return pod. And that's the reason why I only brought one Kerbal in this rover, despite having seats for four. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I couldn't create maneuver nodes and some people might have wondered why didn't I bring a pilot? Well, that's why because we've only got space for one Kerbal inside the return module I guess I could have built a bigger return module, but whatever it's it's small and it's cute and it worked Everything was fine. We can now go back to Kerbin So I'm not gonna waste too much time showcasing the return of Matt Kerman to Kerbin because we've still got to document the return of Captain Kiwi's Kerbals to Kerbin as well 
That's a really difficult sentence to say. Kerbals to Kerbin. Did I say that right? I think I did. <laughs> say it fast three times. I challenge you. That's my that's my TikTok challenge of the week. That's a new segment we're doing. No, it's, it's not. Don't worry. What was that? Here we are in a high Kerbin orbit, by the way. Still no connection to the KSC, so we can't make a maneuver node. Not that we really need to plan a meticulous maneuver node at this point. We're just doing a retrograde burn to land somewhere on Kerbin, ideally in the water, make it all Apollo style, and luckily the stars aligned and we managed to land in the sea. Spoiler alert, by the way. I'm very good at that, aren't I? I talk about things in my videos before they happen, and then when we get to that point in the video that I've already described, I don't really have anything to talk about. Case in point, this very sentence that you're listening to, how meta is that? Wow, what a beautiful sunset. Distracting everyone from that commentary just there. That's a really nice shot, isn't it? Don't want to spend too much time savoring it though, because now we need to go back to Minmus and think about getting Captain Kiwi's Kerbals back to Kerbin as well. First thing we're going to do is get them to board the, uh, the rover here, just to close up the lid and everything to make it a bit more, I don't know, final and a bit... That, that's a better way to store it, I think, on the surface of Minmus. There's no probe core inside the rover, which is probably a bit of an oversight on my part, admittedly, while designing it. So I had to use a Kerbal inside the craft in order to uh, close the cargo bay doors and retract the internal hinge, which I guess now doesn't really serve any purpose because the rocket that was on it has now gone back to Kerbin. You, you just saw that. I don't know why I felt I needed to say that. <laughs> so yeah, there's our ascension from Minmus almost done. Ascensions from Minmus are pretty easy things to do. You can pretty much start flying flat immediately after takeoff unless you have terrible thrust to weight ratio, which in this case we don't. We've got a nice poodle engine, which is pretty powerful uh, for a rocket of this mass. So it was fairly, it was, it was easy to do basically. And then we can form a retrograde burn once in high Kerbin orbit once again to lower our periapsis into Kerbin's atmosphere atmosphere and perform a Kerbin uh, re-entry. Now don't worry, that MUN encounter is going to happen after periapsis, which means we're not going to encounter the MUN. It's not going to mess up our plans or anything like that, so it's not an issue we have to be concerned about if anyone noticed that MUN encounter making manifest itself on the map screen. I just felt like I had to make that sentence more exciting and grandiose because it's the grand finale of the video. The video is nearly coming to an end. Guys, what did you think of it? I, I had fun on this mission. I always do enjoy making Blunderbirds videos, and I thought this was kind of a nice uh, pace break from our normal Blunderbirds, I don't know, routine? What did you think? Let me know. Maybe I could do more in-situ repairs on Blunderbirds rather than just outright rescues. Let me know what you think. Uh, but all of that's for a future video. If you want to see past videos, there are links on screen. <laughs> on the left-hand side is a link to the full Blunderbirds playlist. The right-hand side is a video chosen for you by YouTube's recommendation algorithm. There's also a link to subscribe and check out my Patreon if you'd like to support my channel in either of those ways. Uh, the description has things like merchandise, Discord, Twitter, Instagram, all that good stuff and things like that. And that's my outro. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs>